So do all those first. If you have energy at the end of the workout, then add in isolation work for the biceps, the triceps, that kind of stuff, or put them in on a separate day. Do that and then go for a run or something like that. Add it in on a cardio day or whatever because it's not really that taxing and you can put that into that. But you don't want to steal from the bread and butter movements by fatiguing them, by doing something like the 21 guns and doing half reps and then trying to do full reps after you're done with that. It just doesn't make any sense whatsoever. What's up guys, Aaron Kubitz, personal trainer, Functional Aesthetic CC, helping average guys perform better inside and outside the gym. Today's video, I'm gonna be talking about one of my pet peeves, um, not really, but something that I see frequently, especially among many younger lifters, and that is using advanced training techniques when it doesn't make sense. Today, as the title of the video kind of described a little bit, I'm gonna be talking about the 21 guns uh, exercise protocol, typically used when you're doing bicep curls. So if you're not familiar with what 21 guns is, 21 guns is basically where you're doing 21 repetitions of biceps curls, but you're doing it where you're doing half range of motion uh, either from the, the bottom of the rep range of the curl or the top range of the rep range of the curl, and then you're doing seven from the, so if you start from the top, you're doing seven from the top, seven from the bottom, and then you finish it off with seven full range of motion repetitions. Now, this is where I have the problem first and foremost. This exercise, before I get into all the other problems with this, um, this exercise actually wouldn't be so bad provided it is used in the right context if instead of doing half range of motion uh, for the first 14 reps of the exercise, you do full range of motion reps first and then follow it with half range of motion reps. And um, the reason for this is if you've ever noticed somebody doing chin-ups, for example, right? It's a lot easier to do your chin-ups where you come down halfway and then, you know, you come down to like your arm isn't fully bent and then you pull yourself back up and you come here and then you come back up, right? It's a lot easier to do that than it is to go from a complete dead hang and then pull yourself back up, right? Um, and so for the same reason, when you're doing a biceps curl, the full range of motion rep is gonna be more difficult than doing a half range of motion rep. And this brings me to my second point. These exercises are meant to be advanced training protocols to add extra volume, add extra stress, and induce more stimulus after you've already hit a plateau doing other like more standard traditional workout uh, routines and standard exercises, right? So the 21 guns and other exercises like them, like doing drop sets, negatives, things like that, are uh, things that are t added to create more stimulus. They're just tools in the toolbox, right? But a lot of times, um, especially with guys, you know, um, women tend to not fall into this category quite as much, but as guys, we like to feel like we are working really hard, right? We like to, uh, you know, feel like we are very tough 
you know, we've got all that, uh, you know, testosterone going and stuff like that. And one of the reasons that we lift in the gym is so that we can be bigger and badder than the next guy. At least that is the uh, protocol that a lot of guys follow, right? You want to have bigger biceps, you want to have a stronger deadlift, and or it's like, how much do you bench, bro? That kind of thing, right? And so when we're doing our workouts, whether it's doing a CrossFit workout, how many burpees we can do, uh, doing a Murph, you know, which is basically you do a certain amount of pull-ups followed by a certain amount of push-ups and you go for a run and all this kind of stuff. The more tired and exhausted you can make yourself in a workout, typically the better it is when you're training guys. But the, at the end of the day, we need to remind ourselves, why are we training in the first place? Is it to impress our friends on social media or is it actually get better, get stronger, build more muscle, actually become a better athlete uh, and, and everything like that, right? Because just because you're working hard doesn't mean you're actually producing better results. You also have to work smart. You have to do, put in the extra effort where it makes sense, right? It's kind of like Pareto's principle, right? 80% of the results you get come from 20% of the inputs. So you gotta figure out what are those 20% of inputs that are driving the most results and put 80% of your effort into those, right? And these icing on the cake things like drop sets, negatives, adding extra volume with half reps, such as in the 20 guns, one guns principle uh, or training protocol are just that. They're icing on the cake. They're those finishing moves, the things to add a little bit extra intensity once you've exhausted all those other protocols. And again, coming back to the thing of how hard you're working. If you're running a race, if you're preparing for a marathon or a 10K or whatever the thing is, nobody cares how hard you train in preparation and building up to the competition if you get injured before the competition or you burn yourself out so you perform poorly on, in a competition. Your training is meant to peak you for that specific event to be at your best, right? And so it's about training hard at, at the times it makes sense to train hard and then tapering off, backing off so that you can peak and you can perform at your absolute best when it matters the most. So the third point is that you want to incorporate it into your training when you actually need it, right? So, for example, if let's say you're doing biceps curls or whatever in your typical workout, and you are doing, let's say, three to four sets of eight to 15 repetitions, kind of a broad range, right? And you, hit a, you get to a point where you're, you haven't been able to add any weight or you've added some weight and now you can't add any more repetitions to what you're doing and you've kind of just plateaued and you've been there for several weeks, maybe a month or even more, and you're just kind of stuck there, right? And the typical protocol isn't working for you anymore. Well, the first thing you want to look at is how is your sleep, right? Um, are you getting enough rest? Because that's the time when your body is recovering. It, it takes, you know, the time to recover. When you're sleeping is the time when your body is producing growth hormone, right? When you're sleeping is the time when your body is repairing all the uh, stuff for, uh, and recovering you from the stresses of not only training, but from the stresses of your day-to-day -day life, right? The next thing you want to be looking at is your nutrition. Are you eating the right kind of calories and enough of them? Just because you're eat, if you're eating a lot of calories, but it's coming from a lot of processed carbohydrates, or you're eating a lot of ice cream or all these different things like that, you're not eating enough actual protein, then you're probably not gonna see the best results. On the flip side, if you're eating a ton of protein, but you're not eating enough calories, you're not gonna see the greatest results either because you need to have the right amount of protein with the right amount of calories so that you have not only enough energy, calories to get through the workout and to support the amount of training that you're doing because again, if you're using high volume training techniques like doing full reps and then adding in more half reps at the end, you gotta make sure that you have enough calories coming in. And for a lot of people, this isn't a problem, right? Um, and that's why we have a lot of people that have, are overweight and stuff like that. I mean, obviously there's other reasons as well, but some of that is just because of eating super palatable, highly processed foods, getting too many calories, right? But then on the flip side, you got the guys who are like, I can't gain any weight or I can't build any more muscle. And it's simply because they're not eating enough food, right?
That's one of the reasons like I don't get super massive and stuff because I eat a relatively low calorie diet. I eat higher protein and I do some aerobic exercise and stuff like that. And it maintains me right where I want to be. And so I can lift these heavier weights and do all this kind of stuff. And I don't continue to get bigger because my diet isn't suited to that, those goals of getting bigger. But if your goal is I want to get bigger, you got to make sure that you're getting enough carbohydrates and then moderate amounts of fat in there for hormonal production. And then the standard at least 0.7 grams per pound of body weight um, of, of protein to facilitate growing bigger muscles. And you can just round that up to one gram of protein per pound of body weight to build the bigger muscles. The next thing that you want to look at is your program design, right? Are you allowing, you know, 48 hours between training the same muscle group to the same level of intensity, right? Now, one of the uh, drivers of getting stronger and even increasing muscle size is the frequency of your training, right? Now, you can train the same muscle group a couple times a week, right? But you can't train it at the same level of intensity. So if you are going to be training that same muscle group multiple times a week, you need to make sure that you know, you're not training at the same level of intensity. Maybe have a day where you're doing just kind of a body weight, uh, instead of doing bench presses, maybe you're just doing push-ups. You're still training your chest, your shoulders, and your triceps, but you're also integrating the core so it's a little bit more functional, but you're training the endurance aspect of it, right? Or training a little bit higher reps in the bench press or something, right? Um, and uh, only adding these things in as well after training that muscle group once a week isn't working so uh, is, isn't producing results anymore. Then you can add more frequency in there. Again, it, you want to add the stuff in when it makes sense to add it in. You want to get the minimum effective dose because if you throw everything at it all at once, it's not going to make you produce better results. Uh, it might actually cause you to crash and burn sooner because your body hasn't adapted to that, right? And additionally, if you throw everything at it right, right away, it's the same thing with fat loss, once you hit a plateau, you have nothing left to throw at it to continue seeing results, right? So you want to get the most results you can with the basics, and then when you stall out, analyze, okay, am I doing everything, all the basics right? Okay, I am. Now let's add in some of these more advanced techniques on top of that. So the same thing with the frequency. Make sure that you're getting enough time, rest period, and you, you've properly structured your workouts so you're getting at least 48 hours between workouts, and if there's less time in between workouts for the same muscle group, that you are not doing it at the, at the same level of intensity and it's more of a pump up, get the blood flowing, kind of enhance recovery sort of workout versus break the muscle down for building more muscle and more strength kind of workout. Okay, so now that we've gotten off th through all of that, if you've been doing all this and you need to add a little bit more stimulus, a little bit more time under tension, a little bit more volume to your direct arm work, Right? Because oftentimes you don't even need to do a whole lot of direct arm work. If you're doing, you know, say for example, bent over barbell rows, you're doing pull-ups, things like that, that also incorporate the biceps as well, sometimes you don't need to actually even do a whole lot and you can actually get see some results in your biceps and stuff like that just from doing that. However, I do tend to like to combine a combination of your multi-joint movement like a pull-up or something with doing some biceps curls as well as kind of a finisher. That's how I do it personally at the point that I'm at, right? However, if you get through all this stuff and you've been doing all the things that I've covered here, you are, have the proper workout design with enough rest period in between workouts for the same muscle group, you have the right diet in place, right? You're getting one gram of protein per pound of lean body weight, about half a gram of fat per pound of lean body weight, and then you're getting the rest of your calories, maybe about 10% uh, 10 to 20% more total calories than your baseline calories to facilitate not only the extra energy required in the workout, but also extra energy to add more weight, add more muscle mass to your frame and you're also getting enough sleep then what how I would do the 21 gun protocol is instead of doing seven half reps from the top and then seven half reps from the bottom and then try to do seven full reps because as I stated before full reps are harder than half reps what I would do is do all of my regular working sets right so if I have three or four sets of biceps curls included in my workout, I'm going to do the first two to three sets doing them regular. Regular full range of motion, biceps curls, right? Because those are the hardest way to do it. 
When I hit failure, right, if I'm trying to add another set in there, if I hit failure and I can't do the full range, uh, the full amount of sets uh, of reps that I want to do, or even if I do the full seven reps, but I want to add in a little extra volume, right? So I got that full seven reps. I've been stuck at the same weight for an extended period of time. Uh, I'm not able to actually get any more full reps out. Then I would go and try to do ones from the uh, bottom of the rep range, right? Um, lift it up as high as you can. And then when you fail, let it back down to the bottom, lift it up again, keep on trying to do those uh, failure ones. Now when I think about it though, actually that might fatigue you too much uh, right from the get go there. So what you might want to do is cheat it up to the top. So you get to the top of the range of motion, right? Like this. And then you're going to let it down do to the, the halfway point, bring it back up, let it back down until you feel like, okay, I'm kind of losing control of the weight. I better stop right here and bring it back up, let it down, bring it back up. So do as many reps as you can that way, let it down to the bottom, maybe even set the bar down, shake out your arms a little bit, let that blood flow back in, and then commence trying to do full reps in the bottom. Try to get it up to your shoulders, but you'll probably fail because you're exhausted now, right? Now you get up halfway, let it back down. Try to bring it up halfway, let it back down, right? That is the true purpose of doing these kinds of exercises. You don't wanna be doing half reps before you've done your full reps because you're gonna tire yourself out for the full reps. You wanna do the hardest part of the exercise, and this is why we always do compound movements first, multi-joint movements first in the workout, because why? They use more energy, they use more muscles, and they're more taxing to both the uh, metabolic systems and your central nervous system than doing isolation work. So. Do all those first. If you have energy at the end of the workout, then add in isolation work for the biceps, the triceps, that kind of stuff, or put them in on a separate day. Do that and then go for a run or something like that. Add it in on a cardio day or whatever because it's not really that taxing and you can put that into that. But you don't want to steal from the bread and butter movements by fatiguing them by doing something like the 21 guns and doing half reps and then trying to do full reps after you're done with that. It just doesn't make any sense whatsoever. All right, so the last point that I want to make before closing out this video is when you are looking at workout routines, you know, if you're looking at something in muscle and fitness, um, bodybuilding.com, oftentimes they have some good stuff and everything, but a lot of times, or if you're even looking at the routines of, a, let's say, Arnold Schwarzenegger or Ronnie Coleman or Jay Cutler or any of these uh, professional bodybuilders you see nowadays and stuff, one thing that you have to take into consideration is when you are taking steroids, when you are taking performance enhancing drugs, as every single professional body without bodybuilder without exception in the pro ranks is taking anabolic steroids, right? That you are not going to be able to recover as fast as they can. One of the benefits of taking anabolic steroids is that, uh, and, and also the reason why young guys in their teens and early 20s can train harder and more frequently than guys who are uh, a lot older and stuff is because of the testosterone. It helps you to uh, recover and resynthesize muscle protein much faster, meaning that you can train uh, at a high intensity and do it more often and recover from it so that you can go back in there and build more muscle, right? Now, that is not the only benefit of anabolic steroids. I used to think that was the primary benefit, that it basically just allowed you to train harder. Now, there was actually some studies that were done, though, where they compared a, uh, there was three different groups. They had the one group where they were training uh, uh, natural lifters, natural bodybuilders, you're training, you know, doing hard training and stuff. And after a month of training, they actually added, it was like, on average between two to four pounds, which is actually really good in a month of training to add two to four pounds of muscle mass, right? So they were getting really good results, right? Then they had another group who was on anabolic steroids, but not training at all. And then the third group was on anabolic steroids and they were training, okay? The second group that was on anabolic steroids doing no training whatsoever, gained on average seven and a half pounds of muscle mass just sitting on a couch, okay? So they blew the other, the natural lifters out of the water and they weren't even training. And then obviously when they started training, they saw even, even better results. So anabolic, uh, and the results was around like 13 to 14 pounds of muscle in the same period of time that they gained. So anabolic steroids definitely do work. The more of them you take, 
provided they, they're you know properly and I'm not an expert on these I don't ever plan to take anabolic steroids uh, and stuff but what I know is that the more that you're taking of them you're going to see more enhanced results you're going to see better results right and stuff so but I say all this to say is that you cannot expect to get the same outcomes uh, as an enhanced lifter doing the same workout routine. You're not going to be able to do the same amount of volume and train at the same uh, a level of frequency as somebody who is enhanced. So you got to take that into consideration as well. So when you're doing all these drop sets, negatives, uh, you know, uh, extra half reps, forced reps, all this kind of stuff, and adding that in your routine, you got to make sure that you're able to recover from that as a natural lifter and only add it in when you are, you know, You've been training consistently, using the basics, focusing on the compound lifts, multi-joint lifts, things like that, progressively trying to overload, either adding more weight or more reps to, the, to your workout over time. And when you've kind of hit that wall, hit that plateau, and all your other ducks are in a row, and you're hitting all the basics, and you're still not seeing results, then consider adding in that extra volume, adding in the extra stuff to then spur the muscle growth because you've had the time for your body to adapt to the stimulus that you're providing for it. And so that's the time when you're most likely to see the best results from doing these kind of protocols. All right, guys, that's the end of the video. Uh, hopefully you've gained some benefit from it and you have a better understanding of the reason behind why you would want to use something for 21 guns or something like that, when to put it into your workout. Um, and it's, it's kind of like a icing on the cake sort of exercise to uh, add more time and attention, more volume, and increase the overall uh, uh, amount of weight that you're moving in a workout after you've had an extended period of time of using the basics and you've hit a plateau. If you'd like to see more content related to workout design, kind of like this, um, for whether it's you know losing fat, building muscle, athletic performance, uh, something that I'm moving into in the future is more hybrid athlete style of training, which is kind of a combination of cycling, powerlifting, uh, and bodybuilding, um, with uh, combined with you know maybe running and for some people swimming i don't particularly like swimming i think it's a pretty functional exercise to do uh, but i hate chlorine so unless i have a lake or something like that to uh to work in i probably won't be doing it too much my hybrid athlete style of training is a little bit different than the standard hybrid athlete style of training which typically takes powerlifting and aerobic exercise kind of meshes them together i also like to uh combine uh power type stuff so um Powerlifting is kind of a misnomer because it's actually more strength training. Power is about more speed. So doing sprints, box jumps, more athletic style of training, uh, some bodybuilding style of training, and then calisthenics, body weight, exercise style of training, and then filling it all out with a little bit of uh, endurance work as well. So I'm going to be getting into some of that kind of uh, training stuff in the future in some of my videos as well. Um, and then in the course of um, trying to get to your goals, there uh, usually you're going to get injured at some point, right? So how do you work around those injuries? Um, I myself had uh, separated my AC joint in my right shoulder. I also have a torn labrum in my right shoulder, and I continue to work around that. Um, mainly, the thing is, you lose a little bit of little a little bit of stability, right? Because the labrum is kind of like this cup of cartilage around the top of the uh, glenohumeral joint, right? Where the uh, humerus uh, or the glenoid fossa, right? Where the humerus goes in there, right? And it add it kind of deepens the socket and so when that gets torn you don't have as much of the suction cup capability there and you also don't have as much of that stability so you have to focus more on making sure that your muscles surrounding the joint primarily rear deltoids rotator cuff and stuff like that are balanced out with your pectoral muscles your anterior deltoids and everything to make sure that you're kind of providing that stability to the joint that you have lost a little bit from doing from injuring that thing right so in this channel i help you also to work around the injuries if you do get them how to prevent getting those injuries in the first place some of the reason that i actually got this injury was because of being under a lot of stress at the time and kind of rushing through some workouts as a result of that stress right so some things that you can kind of keep in mind is that when you are stressed you know when you are under a lot of pressure Take some time to 
recognize the fact that, hey, I'm probably not thinking super clearly right now. Go through the protocols, slow yourself down. Even though your body doesn't feel like doing that, you're kind of in that fight or flight mode. Take your time to warm up properly. Take it a little bit easier when you're more stressed because you're gonna be more vulnerable to injury, things like that. And also, the other thing I address in this channel, I had a lot of digestive issues early on, struggled with them for about 10 years, lost about 30 pounds of muscle in the process, and so I also cover a lot of things on how to you know, eat for building muscle, how to eat for performance, and how to eat for losing body fat. So I cover things like that in this channel. If any of that kind of stuff interests you, then consider subscribing to the channel by hitting the button in the lower right-hand corner of the screen um, and hitting that like button if you found some value from the video. All right, guys, see you all next time.